Britain's royal palaces. Majestic. It's absolutely dripping in history. Luxurious. The white drawing room at Buckingham Palace is like a scene from a Disney film. And packed to the rafters with incredible secrets. Secrets that the royal family would much prefer not to be made public. From royal courtships to royal births to royal marriages and scandals, the palaces have played host to all of that. This series goes behind palace walls. The royal palaces represent the monarchy and have incredible history. We'll learn how these iconic creations were built. 16th century kings built with brick in a way that we wouldn't recognize today. This is George IV leaving his mark on the center of London. Uncover the spectacular palace art housed within. The royal collection is vast, and I mean vast. It has more than a million objects spread across all of the royal palaces. Just imagine what has been collected over centuries. So this collection is unlike any other collection in the world. Discover their gruesome stories. It's an amazing insight into the royal's history, but also our common history. Frankly, if you're going to cut the head off a king, it's got to be done in a palace and relive the recent events that shaped the modern royal family. The whole case was an absolute fiasco and a huge embarrassment. The queen was particularly aggrieved that Harry had done it in the way that he had. This is The Secrets of the Royal Palaces. This time, royal security under the spotlight as the Queen gets locked out of her own palace. Nelson's gate wouldn't open and the Queen was actually kind of locked out of her own house. One of our most loved royals is revealed to the world at Balmoral. The impact of these pictures was massive. They went around the world. We explore the blueprints for the most famous royal palace in the world. Every one of those rooms is a glitzy show-off piece. And discover it has unwanted house guests. Buckingham Palace has definitely got a rat problem. And we reveal the secrets of one of its historic royal coaches. The coach isn't just a way of getting the Queen from A to B. It's a time capsule of British history across the ages. Royal palaces are found in every corner of the UK, from Balmoral and Holyrood in Scotland, to Windsor and Kensington Palace in England. There's no doubt that the royal residences are unrivaled, I think, uh, around the world. You know, you have centuries of tradition, priceless artefacts, really important pieces of British heritage on display, and I think we're very lucky to have them. And the history and heritage continue inside the palaces as well, as they also house thousands of priceless treasures. The largest collection of art and furniture and beautiful treasures in whole world. It's really effectively all of these things that have been collected by monarchs over the years. So therefore it's a brilliant collection that reflects our nation's evolution and historical significance. The Royal Collection tells us amazing things about the last 500 years of British and world history. But at Kensington Palace, one of the most historically important artefacts is hidden in plain sight. The weather vane sits on top of Kensington Palace. Built in 1605, the palace is one of the country's most popular visitor attractions, with over half a million people a year walking through these gilded gates. I think most people who come to Kensington Palace are hoping to spot a royal. Sitting on the roof, this weather vane is one of the palace's most incredible secrets, a beautiful golden object nestled between the royal chimney pots. When you approach Kensington Palace, if you look up on the rooftops, you might just make out the glitter of a weather Vein, but there is more than meets the eye to this thing. In 1689, the new monarch, William III and his wife Mary, picked Kensington Palace as their home. These were turbulent times. Crucial battles were being won and lost on the high seas. Everyone was looking for an advantage, and this unassuming weather vane would become William's secret weapon. He had his navy out at at battle and by knowing what direction the wind was blowing in he'd know where the battle would go in his favor or against him but it's what lies beneath this weather vane that makes it one of a kind what william did was he commissioned a really ingenious object that's somewhere between art and engineering and what it meant was that he didn't need to be outside to see the direction of the weather down in the king's gallery there is a map above the fireplace this map is so important 
important because it became the very center of King William's military operations. It's got the four continents in the corner and Great Britain has been made much larger in scale in comparison to the rest of Europe, particularly France, with whom England was at war at the time. It's an amazing work of art, but what's incredible also is the metal dial and how that works. Connecting the two are a series of pulleys. So as the weather vane moves on the roof of Kensington Palace, a dial shifts on the face of the map. Instantly, William could see the direction of the wind and plot his next military manoeuvre on his map. It was a game changer, giving him a crucial edge over the enemy. William that they created, and amazingly, it's still in perfect working order more than 300 years later. William's weather vane may be subtle in his way, but Kensington Palace most certainly isn't. It's one of the most public and easily accessible of all the palaces. For privacy, the royals retreat up to Scotland, to their most secluded palace, Balmoral. Located 100 miles northeast of Edinburgh, Balmoral Estate has been a royal palace since 1852, when Queen Victoria and Prince Albert bought the land and commissioned the castle. Balmoral is where the royals go on holiday, but it's not like the kind of holiday the rest of us have. They are woken to bagpipes in the morning. They are piped into dinner in the evening. They dress up for dinner in formal clothes. It's quite a rigid life, but between those markers during the day, there is enormous freedom. It's the one palace they can almost guarantee privacy, which is probably why so many royal relationships have blossomed there. The Duke and Duchess of Cambridge spent time there when Kate was first being introduced to the family. But probably the most famous Balmoral romance happened in 1980. Prince Charles was getting a bit of a reputation as a man about town and was showing no signs of settling down. The first duty of the Prince of Wales was to find a wife, produce heirs to the throne, because that's, that is their number one priority, securing the line of, of succession. After a series of failed relationships, pressure was mounting from within his family for him to find a suitable match. He was over 30. He had had a string of girlfriends. His father felt that it really was important that he needed to settle down, stop being a playboy, stop playing the field, and find a wife. And the press was also getting restless, going into a feeding frenzy whenever Charles was seen out with a lady. There was a lot of speculation, poor fellow, um, whenever he was seen with anybody, is she the one? He did feel pressure, there's no question, from the press, uh, from the media, and, and indeed from his, from his own family. Then, in September 1980, Prince Charles asked the Queen to invite his latest girlfriend, one Diana Spencer, to Balmoral for the weekend. A positive sign that this relationship was important to him. But for any potential wife or husband, there is a secret tradition that takes place at this royal palace. The Balmoral test, a pretty terrifying moment for any would-be royal girlfriend. You're really given the... Stay in one of the royal residences. I mean, there's a lot of pressure to try and get it right. And um, other girlfriends of Prince Charles had fallen down. Would Diana pass the Balmoral test? This was a make-or-break moment for the budding relationship. The Queen thought this girl is completely charming and she seems to love everything about the outdoors, which of course she didn't at all. But she, she was really putting on a good show. Diana was a huge hit at Balmoral that summer. She fitted in with everything that the royals do up there. She went for long walks, she fell in puddles of mud and got up and roared with laughter. Everybody fell for her that weekend. They have lots of outdoor barbecues where Prince Philip usually prepares and cooks the food. The Queen often does the washing up and Diana was very happy to help. She rolled up her sleeves, by all accounts. She absolutely nailed it. The royal family have an annual holiday at Balmoral. It is one of the high spots of their, of their year, and they are very private there. The press normally leave them alone for quite a lot of the time when they're at Balmoral. But this year, they were joined by Prince Charles's girlfriend, Diana Spencer. She had already passed the royals' Balmoral test and got the family blessing, but now, 
she faced the toughest test of all. How would she deal with the press? The press knew that there was someone around, but they couldn't quite identify which of the glamorous, uh, bright young things who were sort of fluttering around Charles was the latest girlfriend was. So they kind of got away with it for a bit. Photographer Ken Lennox was a regular visitor to Balmoral, taking pictures of the royals on the moors and around the estate. I arrived earlier because Prince Charles would often do a spot of fishing in the River Dee. As I walked from the car towards the river, I saw that there was a young girl there, blonde, quite close to Prince Charles. The girl saw me and left Prince Charles and went into some giant fir trees. The next thing I saw, a compact mirror coming out from behind a tree. She turned her back to them and I think she held up a mirror so she could see them and they saw the mirror glinting. In her life, Diana proved herself savvy. She deliberately didn't want to be photographed. She used that mirror as she walked away. And when I moved to either side to try and photograph her, she used the mirror to keep a tree between me and her. Very clever. I think there's a very good argument for saying that the way she behaved that morning on the riverbank uh, did display an early sign of, of her unique savviness when it came to spotting a camera uh, and the activities of the press. It must have been dawning on Diana now what she was uh, letting herself in for. Keen to capture this newcomer, Ken returned to the riverbank in the afternoon. A Range Rover arrived and I saw the girl again. And this time, she turned and looked at me. She turned and looked right into the lens. I took a photograph, threw some snow, and she turned her head away and went into the fishing hut. But when I got back, despite the bad light and the snow and everything, I got a recognisable photograph of this girl, Lady Diana Spencer. Ken didn't know it then, but he had just captured the first evidence of a relationship between Prince Charles and his future wife. I didn't think of a romance at all at that stage. It was when one of the Royal Retinue said to me, I hear you photographed young Diana Spencer. I said, yes, I did. And he said, don't dismiss it, Ken, which indicated that he thought there was more to come and that uh, it wasn't just a weekend thing. These pictures were the definitive proof of a relationship between Charles and Diana. Ken had a scoop. Charles's new girlfriend and potential future queen. When these pictures were published, oh, is it a new girl in Prince Charles's life? Who is she? And she's very much in the sort of Balmoral milieu. This, this, this aroused lots and lots of interest and lots and lots of speculation, which, which, is, which is great for the press, but more difficult, I think, if you're Diana. The impact of these pictures was massive. Um, they went around the world because at that moment, he was the most eligible bachelor in the world. And the fact that this girl Diana, we now know, was back there so soon after the first uh, spotting, obviously was significant. She was suddenly front page news. And really from that time on, from September 1980 onwards, for the rest of her life, Diana was on the front pages and she rarely left them. Hidden away in the highlands of Scotland, Balmoral had proved the perfect palace backdrop for this blossoming relationship. Buckingham Palace, on the other hand, was designed to be seen. It's the most famous and most visited of all the royal palaces. It's pomp and circumstance, it's royalty, it's queen, it's the most iconic palace in the entire world. Buckingham Palace is monarchy HQ. It is the headquarters of the firm, the British Royal Family. Buckingham Palace was the brainchild of one man, King George IV. George IV was a very self-indulgent king. He loved the pomp and pageantry, and he wanted a palace that was fit for a monarchy that had growing world significance. When George IV came to the throne in 1820, Royal HQ was St. James's Palace. In his eyes, it was old-fashioned and cramped. So he set his sights on a royal building two miles down the road, Buckingham House. George felt 
was a building he could transform into a palace worthy of someone of his status. This was transformative. It was entirely new. He wanted to recast Buckingham House into a building on a European scale. And there was only one architect who could execute George's grand ambitions to build the ultimate palace, John Nash. He'd already built some of the most spectacular buildings Britain had ever seen, including the Theatre Royal Haymarket and Brighton's Royal Pavilion. George IV, the showman, always wanted to show off, and Nash was the man to do it for him. Nash had turned the middle of London into a theatrical promenade. He was ingenious. Nash set about transforming Buckingham House into George's vision of a royal palace, doubling the main block in size and massively enlarging the rest. This is George IV leaving his mark on the centre of London. But only part of Nash's exterior remains today. And it is only seen by a privileged few. For those lucky few invited to a garden party, say, there is an opportunity to see the rear elevations. The yellowy sandstone sloping down to lawns and beyond them, gardens, a lake. It's a neo-French classical style. And it's now, of course, hidden from public gaze. However, the back of the palace was relatively dull in comparison with George and Nash's plan for the front. The pièce de résistance was marble arch. The arch was built in front of the palace as its grand entrance. For a marble from Italy. Every time the monarch swept through there, it would be with an imperial grandeur. But unfortunately, George never did get to sweep through the arch. He died in 1830, aged 67, before his grand palace was completed. The first monarch to move in was Queen Victoria in 1837, but she felt the palace wasn't big enough and started a major expansion project. She added an east wing. She basically needed more room for the kids. And the first casualty of her build was George's marble arch. This arch was basically in the way. It needed to be moved for her to extend the palace. Marble Arch was painstakingly moved, stone by stone, to its current location at the end of Oxford Street. Marble Arch used to be the entrance to Buckingham Palace. Now it's sort of in a busy roundabout. It must have been something of a heartbreaker of a job to dismantle something and then rebuild it for no purpose as what, a folly, an eye-catcher, it just sits there. It was a monument that no one really wanted. But for all Buckingham Palace's pomp and grandeur, it's been hiding a secret for centuries. A secret it would very much like to get rid of. Rats. Buckingham Palace has definitely got a rat problem. When Queen Victoria moved to Buckingham Palace, Queen, she was shocked by how many rats there were. The rats treated Buckingham Palace like their own personal playground. And when Victoria moved in, she tried to put a stop to it. And really, it ended up being a bit of a battle. It got so bad that Victoria had to appoint her own rat catcher. And this was Jack Black, whose title was VR, Rat and Mole Catcher to Her Majesty. And he really was the rat whisperer. I think that Victoria really hoped that he would exterminate the rats for good, but I'm afraid he didn't. The rats continued to plague Buckingham Palace throughout the reigns of all the monarchs. And in World War II, the Queen Mother used to use the rats as target practice. So she had a gun and she was practicing for what to do in case Hitler invaded and she was kidnapped. So she was using these rats for target practice. She got the gun and she used to shoot them in the ruins of this crumbled part of Buckingham Palace. So the rats have always been a problem throughout all of Buckingham Palace. As recently as 2019, exterminators were called in because rats were seen tearing through the royal kitchens. I honestly think that the best place to be in London if you're a rat is Buckingham Palace. There's lots of food, there's lots of hidden places, there's lots of holes because it's such an old house. So rats have a good time in Buckingham Palace and they're historically always lurking under the floorboards. Still to come on Secrets of the Royal Palaces, Nash and George's grand front gate has gone. 
palace's dazzling state rooms more than compensate. The white drawing room is exquisite and that's so deliberate. It's all about reinforcing the mystery of monarchy. And a royal hellraiser wreaks havoc at St. James's. Suddenly his court became one of extravagance, of hedonism and certainly of women. The British royal palaces are as individual as the monarchs they house. For good or ill, these palaces were lived in by the people that were ruling over us going back over a thousand years. So they're an insight into the history of the country, into the archaeology, into the domestic practices, and it's incredible insight in, into everybody's history. The palaces can change as often as the monarchs, falling in and out of favour, being bought, sold, demolished, or extended. But some extensions are more famous than others. When you think of and palace, you actually think of the balcony. Ask anybody across the world, and the landmark they want to go see the most when they come and visit is the infamous balcony. For over a century, it's been the focal point for our national celebrations. It is the place where the royal family and the people connect. Walking out there and seeing the crowds of people cheering must be overwhelming. This stone platform has become the place where we welcome new monarchs and celebrate royal marriages. On this balcony, some traditions have been shaped by popular demand. Prince George of Kent and Princess Marina became the first royals to wave to the crowds in 1934. And in 1981, Prince Charles and Princess Diana bowed to the crowd cheers and became the first newlyweds to kiss on the balcony. A tradition that continues today. The balcony we know today was born out of an ambitious plan to overhaul London's ceremonial centre in the early 20th century. Architect Aston Webb not only gave the palace a new front of Portland stone, but also widened the mall and created Admiralty Arch. I think if George IV had seen Buckingham Palace today, he'd say, that's what I was talking about. It starts with a version of Marble Arch. Then the great road of the mall frames a processional view of Buckingham Palace. And then he guides your eye to the very center setting underneath the focal pediment, a balcony. And the royal family themselves become the very focus of the end of this long parade of greatness. But when Webb began work, Buckingham Palace didn't have a balcony at all. The facade presented to the world was one that could have been the front of a hotel or railway station or one of London's clubs. To travel Buckingham Palace into a more suitable seat of power, Webb naturally turned to Stockport. If you were to take the main part of Lyme Park in Cheshire and just glue it on, you wouldn't be far off what you're looking at today. George V oversaw Webb's work. He made sure that the palace's balcony was front and centre, so that it could be used on occasions when the king and other members of the royal family wished to show themselves the people. Just months after the building was completed, World War I broke out, and the crowds gathered to seek reassurance from the king. But perhaps the balcony's most defining moment came on VE Day in 1945. It talks of it being draped in crimson and fringed in gold, you know, across the sort of grey slash that is the frontage of Buck Powell. There is this kind extraordinary flicker of hope and majesty around which everyone could gather and cheer and say hallelujah because the war was over. It gives a focal point, if you like, for national emotion. Millions watch the royal family standing on the palace's balcony, unaware it's a copy of a Stockport stately home. But not all monarchs use their palaces to celebrate moments of national pride. Back in the 17th century, 
the particular hell-raising earl, used St. James's Palace to throw bashes that threatened to ruin the reputation of his king, Charles II. Charles had a group of male friends, which was perhaps the most shocking group of male friends you could possibly imagine, and they were called the Merry Gang. His court became one of extravagance, of hedonism, and certainly of women. The head of this lot was John Wilmot, second Earl of Rochester, who we know now through what are the rudest poems in the canon of English literature you will ever find. I mean, there aren't many about trees and flowers, frankly, that everyone did go too far. And what he did was he wrote this poem called A Satire on Charles II, and it was savage. It savaged the king, it savaged the court, and it was so disdainful. And this is the worst line for me. Rochester said of the king, restless he rolls about from whore to whore, a merry monarch, scandalous and poor. So Rochester really was never again the king's friend. This poem marks the final break. That was the end of Rochester as being part of the king's court until his death, finally, fittingly, of syphilis in 1680. When royal palaces aren't being temples to debauchery, they're normally used as working buildings, the offices of the monarchy. Buckingham Palace is the Queen's main work address. It's here she spends most of her weekdays carrying out the duties of state. But most Thursdays, she gets to get away from the office and travel up to Windsor, the palace she thinks of as home. Windsor Castle is the Queen's favourite of all of the royal residences. It is the one place that she considers home. Windsor is the one that means the most to her. It's a journey that's made most weeks and should run like clockwork. It's all about communication. When Her Majesty leaves Buckingham Palace, they will choose a route and through an encrypted system will inform Windsor Castle that Her Majesty is on way and that the ETA is roughly half an hour or whatever. But on the 5th of March, the Queen turned up at one of the palace's many side entrances, ready to start her weekend, only to find the gates of the castle firmly shut. <laughs> convoy arrived at Nelson's Gate in Windsor, it, it wouldn't open. <laughs> the Queen was actually kind of locked out of her own house. Normally with royalty, it's rather like it's rather like the door at number 10, it opens as you arrive. Similarly with royalty arriving at a palace, the gates open and then the gates shut after, after she's gone in, but just didn't seem to happen this particular day, which is astonishing, really. Clearly, communication went wrong with whoever was charged with opening that door. The Queen, who values punctuality, can be seen looking very fed up in the back of her car with one of her dogs for company. Passers-by were taking pictures and kind of laughing because the Queen kind of sat there like a sitting duck. It was all rather embarrassing. Unfortunately, the gates of the castle remained shut, even after a little gentle persuasion from one of her protection officers. One of the bodyguards got out, a female bodyguard. I think they With the gates not budging, they had no choice but to try something else. When the Queen is in a motorcade, you have to keep moving. You never, ever want to stop. That's why they sail through red lights and they've got police outriders, because the moment the car with the principal stops, they're, they're a sitting target. So the protocol is always to keep moving. I would imagine temperatures went up somewhat, but you are trained to look at plan B and plan C if necessary. The cops have to do a U-turn. The cops have to do like a kind of circuit of Windsor while they alerted staff to get the gate open. Thankfully, after a quick trip around the block, her security team managed to contact the castle and inform them they had... was a man called Jim Frecklington, and I think it's fair to say he was an obsessive. He had actually already designed a coach for the Queen. That was the Australian state coach that was gifted to her in 1988. But with this, he wanted to do something even more extraordinary. Frecklington wanted the coach to be history personified and packed with historic artefacts. You can see immediately when you look inside the coach that something special is going on. It's got this incredible patchwork of different small wooden panels. There's a piece of Canterbury Cathedral, there's a piece of Carnarvon Castle. 
There's something from 10 Downing Street. You've got something from Henry VIII's flagship, the Mary Rose. There's even something from the apple tree that Isaac Newton sat under. The handrails are a very personal touch for the Queen because they come from the decommissioned Royal Yacht Britannia. The coach isn't just a way of getting the Queen from A to B. It's a museum on wheels. It's a time capsule of British history across the ages. All in all, it took nearly a decade and the combined efforts of 50 craftsmen to complete the coach and ship it to the UK, missing the Queen's 80th birthday by eight years. But the final result is truly extraordinary. Ultimately, it wasn't just made to be this wonderful plaything. It's actually a serious working piece of equipment. So it's very much a working work of art. And with its elegant combination of glamour, history, and modern convenience, it's a coach well worthy of its place in Buckingham Palace's Royal Muse. From a vast expanse of Royal Mall to the imposing 20th century facade of Buckingham Palace, it's all about showing off. When you walk in, it's a little bit like the TARDIS. You get past the kind of dull grey exterior and in you go and all is opulent. And this wonderful sense of being transported into another world. George IV and his architect John Nash transformed what was Buckingham House into this most famous of royal palaces. Guests enter the Grand Hall and make their way through to the Grand Staircase. The Grand Staircase is a double-legged staircase that sweeps up to the first floor apartments. If you look up to this glass ceiling, it's almost like God is shining down on you. And of course, lest we forget, and I'm sure George IV never forgot, royalty especially was regarded as God's appointed messenger on earth, the divine right of kings. After the staircase, visitors arrive at a series of state rooms. The sequence of rooms by design in a royal palace are intended to get grander and grander as you get closer and closer to the heart of the monarchy and the private apartments of the monarch. But what's notable here is that they're all splendid. The state rooms can many great treasures from the royal collection, including the greatest painting and sculptures through the ages, and some of the best English and French furniture in the world. Every one of those rooms is a glitzy show-off piece. The grandest of all the state rooms is the white drawing room. The white drawing room is exquisite, and that's so deliberate. It's all about reinforcing the mystery of monarchy. The grandest of the state rooms, adorned with French and English, finest porcelain and furniture. The white drawing room at Buckingham Palace is like a scene from a Disney film in many ways. You have these incredible high ceilings, everything decorated in gold, gold piano, enormous chandeliers. You know, it's what you'd imagine the Queen's Palace to look like. This room holds a palace secret. If you look very carefully, there are two mirrors and one of them is just a chink ajar. And if you ask very nicely, someone might show you that it actually opens slightly. And that is the way that the Queen accesses her private apartments. The Queen enters from her royal closet and out she pops uh, there to be presented uh, among the chosen few. So really, um, Nash did us proud, or rather, did her proud. With no expense spared, Buckingham Palace has been wowing kings, queens, presidents and the public for hundreds of years. It's the quintessential palace in the heart of London. Next time, an ex-royal butler accused of stealing from the palace reveals the impact of these shocking charges. The bottom of my wall fell out. I was heading straight to prison. We uncover the secrets of Balmoral, a favourite getaway for generations of royals. This was their patch, where they could do things how they liked. And tensions rise at the palace as President Trump breaks the rules. Trump knew he needed to be on the very best behaviour.
approach Kensington Palace, if you look up on the rooftops, you might just make out the glitter of a wet vein. But there is more than meets the eye to this thing. In 1689, the new monarch, William III and his wife Mary, picked Kensington Palace as their home. These were turbulent times. Crucial battles were being won and lost on the high seas. Everyone was looking for an advantage. And this unassuming weather vane would become William's secret weapon. He had his navy out at sea at battle. And by knowing what direction the wind was blowing in, he'd know where the battle would go in his favor or against him. But it's what lies beneath this weather vane that makes it one of a kind. What William did was he commissioned a really ingenious object that's somewhere between art and engineering. And what it meant was that he didn't need to be outside to see the direction of the weather. Down in the King's Gallery, 